Welcome all the One of the key parts of any pagan spirituality from around the world are temples and sacred places. Hollowed areas that were marked off as a place of worship and connection to gods, spirits, and other higher powers. It could have been something as basic as a grove that you might find right outside your backyard today where you live, or as spectacular as an ancient stone fortified region and everything in between. In this video we are going on a journey discovering the similarities and differences between Greek and Norse temples and sacred spaces and how we can learn from that in our practice today. So the main difference at first glance is pretty clear. Look at the magnificence of these Greek temples. These are better built and have been there for much longer than any Norse temple. In fact, one might even argue that there weren't even any temples in the north of Europe just because we don't have any still standing examples of this. But that would be very mistaken. This brings us to our first key difference, that in the south of Europe, they built great structures and statues of their gods as their sacred places and in the north of Europe our temples were simply untamed spaces out in nature as Tacitus wrote about 2000 years ago. Now the Romans and Greeks at the time had been constructing temples and statues to their gods for centuries but the Germanic peoples at this time period at least did not do this at all. However, in the north of Europe, we had many, many temples as well. Although there wasn't necessarily any structures here, um, this would have been a traditional uh, pagan temple just purely out of nature, just like Tacitus uh, said in Germania. When archaeologists uncovered this place, um, they actually don't call it a temple. They call it an Iron Age uh, burial site. I am completely 100 and million percent uh, in disagreement with them about that for three reasons. Uh, very simple, it's that this place has the three characteristics that pretty much any other temple in the Norse or just European uh, tradition at the time would have had. First, it was near a sacred spring, and right here you see where the spring would have been back in the Viking Age. It also has a grove here, um, not just in the Norse sources, but in Roman, Greek, even sources all over the world. We know that groves were sacred places, and there is one right here. Also, another common characteristic of a temple is that they have this uh, wall here and piles of stones enclosing the area. So these are three things that are uh, traits of pretty much any type of temple that you will find all over Europe, and that's exactly what we're going to cover in this video. So, while we fly down to Greece on our journey, showing you here some quotes from some ancient Greek texts to show you exactly what I mean. Not just archaeological evidence, but primary written sources from the time showing that temples were in the near vicinity of sacred groves, springs, and surrounding enclosures included usually made of stone. This is not something just common in Norse and the Greek world, but all over Europe as far as sacred sites go. It's just that the Greeks have the best preserved records and archaeology of it. So here is a perfect example. We're here at the Temple of Apollo in Rhodos, and this is an example of what a smaller, more rural temple would be like. So there are a lot of Greek temples, of course, that are big and magnificent and can blow any Norse temple out of the water. But what people forget is there were a lot of smaller, uh, more rural temples that local smaller communities would go to, and this is one of them. Some Greek religious sites didn't even have temples like this one here, though. They were referred to as sanctuaries, these smaller, more minimalistic places, and they may have just been an altar with a small open air enclosure surrounding it, just like the temples of the people living in Scandinavia. They used them for the same types of purposes, and they were taken care of with the same respect. One law in ancient Greece details that should, there should be no pasturing on a sacred temple of Chios, and no manure anywhere near that, and it details punishments for such a crime and how to report it if you saw someone violating. 
Although the Norse were not as organized about this, they had the same concept of their sacred spaces. In the Eyrbyggja saga, there was a temple for Thor built on a place called Helgafell, Iceland, uh, where there were no livestock permitted, and the people residing nearby dug a ditch a far distance away from the temple where all the uh, feces and piss would be disposed of. It was also mandatory in Greek uh, temples to wash yourself before you came in, and you could not walk barefoot in any of those. So temples in both places, although they were often sometimes just a simple, untamed part of nature, but they were to be taken care of and treated as well as if it were someone's private home even. It is worth noting though that sometimes even entire islands as a whole were designated as the most sacred of spaces and were to be taken care of as such. Here is one example from ancient Greece, the island of Delos. We also have a similar island regarded as the most sacred by the Germanic peoples at the time of Tacitus. We think this unnamed island may refer to Samse in Denmark. So both of these locations would have been nature-based and any human-built structures on there would be minimal but still taken care of even though it was a wild, off-charted island. Of course, certain city-states in Greece, though, they had more resources and infrastructure to build things much larger, a perfect example being at the Acropolis of Athens. But then, taking it to the next level, we have things like this, the Parthenon at Acropolis and some of the other uh, no longer standing uh, temples, mostly to the goddess Athena, and there is simply nothing of this magnitude built anywhere in Scandinavia. But it's not because Scandinavians of the Viking Age were dumb or lazy and we couldn't build these things ourselves, of course we would, would have been capable, it's just that we had much smaller populations and we didn't have the resources nearby or even the time to allocate to these types of things. However, that of course doesn't mean that we didn't build temples in Scandinavia. When we're talking about 2,000 years ago at the time of Tacitus, most likely the people of Northern Europe didn't have temples of the time. But at some point before the Viking Age, they definitely started to build temples, although none of them are still standing today and archaeological evidence is sparse, we have many written records of them. This brings us to our next destination here, um, where the grandest temple of the Viking Age, at least in this area, would have stood. Uh, right here, it's just a church, uh, um, by the way, where most of my family has had farmland for many centuries and where many of them are still buried, so we're smack dab in the middle of my ancestral homeland here. But this brings us to a very important uh, difference between Greek and Norse uh, temples. Whether they were just a hall or a couple trees or massive structures like we've seen in the Greek temples, who actually knows how big this one would have been here um, because the church destroyed it and built a church right over the top of it. And this is the main characteristic of any uh, real Norse temple and even the Greek ones too to some extent is that these sacred places were built on top of um, uh, by the church and they converted these sacred places into a Christian thing. So there are multiple sources all over the north of Europe instructing the Catholic rulers of the time to do this at an aim at converting the native people. This is something that happened in the Mediterranean too, such as the temple in Lindos that you see here with a, a temple of Athena destroyed and a church built at this site. But not to the same degree that it happened in Scandinavia. That's why many of these Greek temples are still standing today and we have no Scandinavian temples standing still today. So if you want to know where all of these sacred pagan sites and temples were during pagan times in Scandinavia, just look at where all the oldest churches are and 99% sure that was one of them. Also a very important note, the church would have let some structures stand but destroyed others, depending on the purpose of those temples. Also, one very interesting thing, you will find the temple behind me of Hephaestios, the temple of metal workers, uh, is one of the best preserved temples we have. But the other temples right near here, such as uh, the temple of Ares, the god of war, is completely destroyed um, and this was for very good reason and this happened in the Norse world as well 
And as you see here, literally right next to the Temple of Hephaestus, the Temple of Ares, the God of War, completely leveled to the ground. Of course, the church would not have felt as strong of a need to destroy the Temple of Hephaestus, the God of Metal and Blacksmithing and completely opposite to the Temple of Ares. Needless to say, the Christians didn't exactly want the pagans to be invoking their mighty war god so they could rise up and fight against them. So that's why these temples to different gods were destroyed. And we have similar examples of this in the north of Europe. But while we are here at the Agora of Athens, this brings us to another note about Greek and Norse temples is that temples were sacred spaces that were located some distance away from the main city or town. Although there are some exceptions, such as the Temple of Ares or Hephaestus here, right in the middle of the Greek Agora of Athens, which was basically right in the middle of the main administrative uh, district of Athens in general. Most Greek temples, though, were a good distance away from any city or town just like the written records of the Norse temples that we have. Although archaeology, exactly where those temples were in Scandinavia is much harder to pinpoint, of course, because they were all destroyed. However, though, there are some temples and sacred spaces that were too massive for the church to destroy completely, even though they tried. And finally, towards the end of the video, leads us here to Delphi. So this is basically the Mecca of the ancient Greek world. Not only is it one of the richest and grandest uh, structures of all the ancient Greek world, not only did people flock here from all over the known world to hear from the uh, oracle at Delphi, in that temple right down there, uh, but it is also one of the uh, places with the richest and best preserved temples, just like you see down there, the temple to Apollo. So this is basically the uh, grandest pagan temple uh, that we have of the Indo-European world at least, and this is where we end the video. <coughs> so Delphi was believed by the Greeks to be the center of the inhabited world. They referred to it as the Omphalos, or the navel. And within the Greek temples, they had another navel that was marked off by a big circular stone in the middle of the temple, just like our belly button navel is in the center of our body, and it's where the umbilical cord attaches. The significance and spirituality of that I won't go into in this video, or whether they may have had these stone navel uh, structures in Norse temples too, but it's important to note that this navel is not where the altar would have been and where sacrifices would have made. In the Norse and Greek world, the basics of a sacrificial temple altar would have been the same in both places. A big stone slab or pile of stones or a hörgir as it was called in Old Norse where sacrifices would be made. But in the largest Greek temples, the size of them would have been much larger, of course. This one at the Temple of Zeus in Athens in its heyday would have been two levels, 22 feet high by 122 feet in circumference. And this was a main function at the temples, to be able to host thousands of people all making sacrifices to their gods at the same time. This is why it was much bigger than any Norse altar would have been. However, the real main attraction at this temple of Delphi was the oracle who was there, visited and consulted by people from all over the known world. Delphi had a full-time staff there, um, treasury and other administrative people, and everything there was centered around the Cirrus, the oracle, the Sibyl, who would inhale the sacred fumes get up to a trance state in order to be possessed by the god Apollo to speak on his behalf and give prophecy and guidance. Although the Oracle of Delphi would have been similar in function to our Völva in the Norse religion, the Cirruses of the north of Europe, they don't seem to be particularly associated with any temples in the north of Europe like the Greek oracles were in Delphi. But if Völva were at the highest center of the Norse or Germanic world, where would they have been? Where would our main temple, where would our Omphalos be? Where would the grandest site have been and where was the Mecca of the old Norse or Germanic religion? 
in the Old Norse Germanic world, our Mecca would have been at a place called Irminshul, the highest of all sacred places in the Germanic religion at the time. Tacitus described this place 2,000 years ago as a massive pillar reaching far into the sky, and it was a central gathering site of all the Germanic peoples, just as Delphi would have been for the Greeks. Just before the Viking Age, however, this sacred place was destroyed by Charlemagne when he waged war upon the pagan Saxons and massacred anyone who didn't convert to Christianity, using his own army to tear down whatever it was that stood at Idiminshur. So at this point in our history, just before the Viking Age, our most sacred place was gone. It was destroyed. After this, Arguably the most sacred pagan site in the Norse religion was at Uppsala in Sweden. As Adam of Bremen writes, as late as the year 1076, the grandest pagan temple in Uppsala is where all pagans would come from all over every nine years to make sacrifices at the largest high festival. Again, there's not much archaeological evidence of where this temple or meeting ground stood because it was destroyed and eventually had a cathedral built on top of it here too, like all the other temples we have spoke about in Scandinavia today. But regardless, this would have been the Mecca of the Norse pagan world, just as Irminshul was before it was destroyed. Before we finish the video, after all of these similarities, it's important to note some differences in the two cultures' temples and some fun facts for us today to help us construct a temple in the most accurate way possible. One key difference is that Greek sacred spaces it was something that nobody was permitted to die in or even give birth in. Under no circumstances was any change of life um, permitted to be taken place inside the temple uh, walls. Norse temples, quite the opposite. Plenty of records of human sacrifice at Norse temples, and there's also remains of humans and sacrificial tools shown there, so definitely there was death that took place in the Norse temples. Also the burials. Burials were something that was forbidden in Greek sacred spaces, but encouraged in the Norse ones. It would be part of the sacredness that brought people of the highest status to be buried in those places, like here at Birundlanes or Borje. Sometimes these burial grounds even turned into a sacred space for worship after whoever it was that was buried in there. One other interesting uh, aspect is that Greek temples did not permit any sexual relations and you had to wash yourself if you had sex before coming into a temple. This, according to the ancient Greeks, is something that only the Egyptians did as well, whereas one source writes that all other peoples of the time permitted sex in their temples because they noticed animals coupling there. The Greeks had knowledge of the Scandinavian and Germanic peoples at this time, so, you know, thinking about that, it is possible that they considered them when writing this source, so it is possible that sex was permitted in the Norse and Germanic temples, but I don't know, you can believe that if you want. No being skanky hoes, though, <laughs> engaging in promiscuous behavior. Anyone who committed adultery would not be permitted inside a Greek temple. And anyone, if, if any adulterer uh, did walk into the temple, any of the other citizens there were permitted to enforce this by beating the adulterer within an inch of their life with no punishment. This was actually encouraged. It was only adulterers and murderers that were not allowed into any Greek temple, whereas everyone else, even slaves and foreign non-citizens, would be allowed here, but murderers and adulterers would not be. The Germanic peoples at the time had just and as negative of a view on murder and promiscuity, so they probably had the same laws in their temples too. Other than that, the main key difference, like I said at the start, was the size of the structure and building materials used. Of course, the Greeks had larger populations and more marble slabs and other natural resources to build structures this big, whereas the Norse did not. They would have made temples mainly out of wood, 
However, it is worth noticing that the oldest temples in Greece were also primitive structures built of either wood or terracotta. It actually wasn't until the 600s BC that we start to see these larger stone constructions of temples starting to be built in ancient Greece. But before then, the archaeological remains show smaller temples just built simply of wood or terracotta, like I mentioned. Actually, almost identical to the archaeological remains of what we have of Norse temples, of the few that there are. So, in my opinion, Norse and Greek temples really were not different at all. It just depends on the time period. There would have been about 1500 years difference and the temples would have been the same. And if the Norse society and religion wasn't disrupted and outlawed by the church at the time it was, we may even have seen grand temples in Scandinavia built of beautiful stone and marble that would have lasted until today and rivaled the ancient Greeks once. But we don't. Nothing we can do now besides wonder what the past would have been like and try to rebuild it. So follow us closely. It is one of the main goals of this channel to build a temple in a very sacred place. And we will do that hopefully within the next few years. So follow close. But that's all for today. Hope this was informative. We see us next time.